Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of uh, Preaching to the Choir Ministries and today I'm going to respond to three videos that was made in response to my three questions regarding one saved, always saved and without further ado because this video is going to be kind of long, uh, let's get into it shall we? I've decided to concoct three questions to prove that once saved, always saved, is not as ironclad as I make it as brother. The first question, does sin separate us from God? Yes or no, brother? Number two is, as a Christian, can your sin take you out of fellowship with God? Can your sin separate you from Almighty God, brother? The third and final question is just as good, brother. If, as a non-believer, sin separates you from God, if, as a Christian, you sin and that takes you out of fellowship with God, does that mean you have fallen from grace, brother? He is the corpse, he is the corpse who is now no now more. Now no more. He, has he has risen when called by, by the Lord. Lord. When he rebelled he against rebelled God, he understood the price. And when it comes to waking up from his rest, he ain't too nice. Here he is, rising from Sheol and Hades. Wretched and totally depressed. To answer three questions from someone named G Man about once saved, always saved, or as the Calvinists like to call it, perseverance of the saints. At least that's their doctrine. I don't know. What the others would be. Uh, I think some Calvinists would say that there's a difference between perseverance of the saints and once saved, always saved. But uh, that's your problem, not mine. I'm waiting for you to answer my question. First question. Does sin separate us from God? As you can see, it is because of these. And electricity provided by the Lord Almighty that I even have a chance of my dead corpse even roaming and walking this plane, this earth again. For it is said in the sacred scriptures of Romans chapter 6 verse 23 for the wages of sin is death, and death separates you from your Creator, from God Almighty Himself. So yes, according to the Bible and what the early church believed, sin separates you from God Almighty. Mighty himself. Now, your second question. Um, before you go any further, I like to say I agree with you. The Bible says that we have all sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. And Adam and Eve is a perfect example, uh, the first example and the perfect example of uh, what we have in the scriptures of uh, someone who had a relationship with Almighty God and you know their sin separated them from God. So. Uh, then obviously we got Lucifer and what happened in heaven and everything. So, um, yeah, I'm in agreement with you. But uh, what about the second question? Your second question. If you are a Christian, does sin separate you from fellowship with God? 
The answer is no. Why? Because if you would read Romans chapter 8, and I believe the verses are verse 38 to 39, correct me if you want, for I am a mere fool, a wretched, totally depraved fool who tried to rebel against the Creator once. It is said that the Apostle Paul was convinced that by neither anything that he could think of at that moment was he able to think of anything that could separate him from the joy he had in Christ Jesus. Now, I will ponder upon something that is mentioned within the third question. Well, there's a couple of things that I want to say. First and foremost, um, just write your character that you have on your channel, Christian Anarchist. Uh, first of all, I find them to be very entertaining. Uh, but I got a problem with that. You see, you call yourself a Calvinist and you believe in total depravity. In that, and because man is so totally depraved, he can't really understand or comprehend God's word. God's word. And you yourself are playing the character of, of, of being someone who's totally depraved, someone who's righteous, someone who came from the dead. And you're attempting to answer the deep things about God that we're talking about right now. And I'm trying to figure out how is that possible, especially being a Calvinist. By the very doctrine of being totally depraved, once you're born again, you're not totally depraved no more. You can choose God all day long once you become a believer. So I'm still trying to figure out why would you use a wretched character to make your point? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Oh, and one more thing. I also disagree with you about this idea that sin won't separate us from fellowship with Almighty God. I got a verse of scripture here I want to read to you real quick. Maybe you didn't see it first 20 times you read the Bible or whatever. But uh, and I'm just joking. I'm not saying that you actually read the Bible that many times, all right? First uh, John chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and 11. And it says, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which things is true in him and in, and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness, even until now. He that loveth his brother, his brother abideth in the light. And there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now, I do want to make it clear that when you're in something, you are in it. When you're in Christ, you are in Christ. You are in fellowship with him. You are built with the Holy Ghost. You are living out what God has called you to do. But when you're not in Christ and you're in the flesh, then you're going to act as if you're part of the world. So if you're going to say that you're in Christ and you hate your brother, then no, you're not in Christ. You're in darkness. You're not seeing correctly. You're in a backslidden state. If you don't repent, you will not be in right standings with God. Okay? We, if, if we sin against God, we have to repent of those sins. If we do not repent of those sins, our standings with God will not be good. Okay, and I'm talking about backsliding at this point. I am not talking about apostasy. There is a difference between the two. There's some other scriptures I want to read to you too as well. Okay, so let's go back to the book of Genesis again. Genesis chapter 8. And it says, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter chapter 3. I'm sorry, verse 8. And it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden garden. If you don't know what I was reading, after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they wasn't looking for God. They wasn't seeking his righteousness. They wasn't worshiping him. They wasn't doing what he wanted them to do. When they heard God coming, they hid from him. So yes, sin does take us out of fellowship with God. And don't say that this is the Old Testament. There was no law at this particular time. Adam and Eve saw God with their eyes. Okay, they had fellowship with him. They spoke directly to him. There was no mediator between Adam and Eve and God. They actually had a better and more privileged relationship with God than what we have today. We have to go through a mediator. That mediator is Jesus Christ. One that we, we hear about, with, but we have never seen with our eyes. That we believe on by faith. Okay, 
So I just want to put that out there that our sin does separate us from God. We have a quadrillion different examples in Scripture that we can look at from Genesis to Revelation. But I want to hear what you got to say about the third question if you actually go into it. Does, I, you know what, go ahead, I will answer. Does sin, when if we sin, as the believers, and sin separates us from God, does that mean we have fallen from grace? Now, again, I understand that this is acting and all this stuff and whatnot, but I very much disagree that a non-believer can answer such a question. Even this wretched mankind uh, abyss character that you've made up, uh, Frankenstein or whatever, but let's see what he got to say. And you mentioned Galatians 5, 4, where it says the following, as I use one of my weapons that I have to just find, the Holy Bible, Paul, says the following in Galatians, that you, who are trying to be justified by the law, have been alienated from Christ. And you have fallen away from grace. Now, in the notes, if you have a study Bible, like the NIV, that can help you, in it, it says, this is placed by fallen from grace. In that verse, it's meaning, place yourself outside the scope of divine favor. Because gaining God's favor by observing the law and receiving it by grace are mutually exclusive. Now it says to go for a side note, to a cross-reference, in the same letter, addressed to the church, to the Galatians. In chapter 3, verse 3, where it says, Are you so foolish after beginning, beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? In it, when it's talking about this on the note, both salvation and sanctification are the work of the Holy Spirit. So, if you try to justify your own works, you weren't saved from grace. Because if you were, then you would be well aware that justification by grace alone, by faith alone, that's the gospel. You aren't justified by works that you do. It is only by the Holy Spirit that you are saved. I shall now return to the grave, for I am done with the purpose that the Lord has temporarily called me to do. Okay, first I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 4, but I'm going to start from verse 1 and go to verse 4 to teach Christian Anarchy something here real quick, okay? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if ye accept circumcision, Christ will be of no, no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, uh, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace for for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now, I went to verse 5, but I wanted to build that there. These people are starting off with Christ and are being told that if they allow themselves to be deceived by the liar of circumcision, those of you who don't know, in ancient Israel, in order to be shown that you were right with God, you had to get circumcised uh, uh, as a sign to everyone else. Uh, uh, that that you would that they, that that you was a uh, Israelite and that you was under their Jewish law, okay? And um, Christian anarchists, um, these people started off with Christ. These liars came into the church telling them that they had to go back to the law and they had to be circumcised. Paul was saying, if you do that, then Christ would be no effect to you because now you're seeking to be justified by the law and not of Christ. 
Okay? And if you're intellectually honest about what the passage of Scripture is saying there, when it says that you are severed, let's say you severed my arm from my body. Are you going to tell me that my, that, that my arm was never attached to my body to begin with? Okay? If you are severed from something, then you was part of it at one time. Okay? So, if a person would give in to these false teachings regarding the law, they would no longer be in fellowship with Almighty God. They would no longer uh, uh, be a child of God. Question number one. Does sin separate the non-believer from God? We both agree with that. Question number two. Does sin um, uh, take us out of fellowship with God as a Christian? You said no, I say yes, and I gave you scripture reasons why. Question number three. If the second question, if, if the second question is right, well, let's follow my train of thought, my train of logic here. If sin separates the non-believer from God, if sin separates the Christian from having fellowship with him, I didn't say that that your sin would, 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 would apostatize you from the faith. I'm simply saying that it would separate you from God. Then number three, if we continue in that sin, will it ultimately cause us to apostatize from the faith? Well, if you're giving into false teachings, of course it will. And that's and, and, and that's if you're looking at the scripture without the tulip. And I know it's hard for you guys to do that, but you should try to do that sometimes. And by the way, Christian anarchists, I have a little test for you to prove to you that your sin will separate you from fellowship from God. A little test. I'm not telling you to go do it. This train of thought should be able to help you out here a little bit, okay? I want you to go buy a stack of porn and I want you to go to watch it tonight. And then I want you to go to church and attempt to praise and worship them after the after your preacher or your pastor finishes preaching against porn. Okay? And then tell me what kind of relationship you'll have with Jesus Christ. I can assure you of this. That relationship will not be as good as you think it is. <laughs> now on to the next video. <laughs>
I remember a previous video where you were talking about First John, right? A person who would test all the spirits, principalities and powers to see whether they come from the true source of life, right? God himself or against his word. So we should test the spirits to see whether they line up um, with the revelation of God. The if so if if what you mean here is just simply stated that if what you mean by fellowship is love, then then here's my answer. And this will tie in with my one of my questions. I only have two questions for you later. Let me just scroll down here uh, because I have it all prepared for you here. I notice you, you're about to include rape, murder, envy, and strife. But you're asking, as a believer, can your sin take you out of the fellowship of God? So if what you mean by fellowship with God is the love of God, right? The reconciliation rather than the separation of God. Because we were previously separated. As, as question one illustrates. The answer is then, um, can that take us out of fellowship with God? And the answer is no. Since we've been reconciled with God within creation, if that's what you mean by fellowship, and I'm gonna give you some verses for this, okay? I'm gonna try to make this as quick as possible. This is found in Romans 8, 28. Uh, through 39 and so my answer is going to be no nothing in all of creation can separate a believer from the love otherwise known as fellowship or reconciliation with God it says and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us who is against us? How did not uh, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, speaking of believers, of course, how will he not also with him freely give us all things who will bring a charge against God's elect? I would say that your question is bringing a charge against God's elect. God is the one who justifies, it says. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus, see who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And, and here's where my answer fits in. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or did, Paul exhausts these terms, do you know? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And he launches into a doxology, just as it is written. For they say we are being put to death all the day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither, and here's another exhaustive list. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor this exhaustive list, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the answer to your question is, uh, since rape, murder, and envy, and strife are a part of the created order, since you're about to include those things, my answer is an unequivocal no. And I thoroughly disagree with you, and I'll tell you why. Number one, let's go back to uh, what, uh, what fellowship is with Almighty God. Fellowship is a relationship with God. Uh, that communication that we, ha we have uh, with him through prayer, 
uh, uh, the fellowship we have with him through Bible study, the fellowship we have with him uh, when we worship him, the fellowship we have with him when we go to church and we use our spiritual gifts to glorify his name, which is another act of worship and an act of obedience at the same time. Um, again, that fellowship can be hindered. It can be hindered when a believer chooses to walk outside of the will of God, okay, and chooses to do his or her own thing and then choose and, and, and then inadvertently uh, don't have that same fellowship. I'll give you a perfect example. It's, it's the same thing I ask Christian anarchists. If you go buy a stack of corn and you watch that, um, what kind of relationship do you think you're going to have with God if you don't repent? Now, you're probably saying a Christian would never do that. What are you, a sinless perfectionist or something? Christians do this stuff all the time. Are you living on planet Earth? You have people who love the Lord Jesus Christ who are weak in some areas. They watch porn. They stay, They they get high. I mean, I, mean, I, I actually did a Google Hangout where I had Christians in the room saying that using drugs was okay, that there was nothing wrong with watching the occult on TV and buying occult products for their children and thinking that no spiritual harm would be done to them at all. But let's also take a look at what you're saying about the elect. Again, you act as if there's only one doctrine of the elect. There's actually three to five um, um, understandings of uh, the elect in scripture. Your, your belief of the elect is that God... Uh, look, through, uh, look through the corridor of time and decided to choose this person to be saved, this person to be saved, this person to be saved. And by default, these three other people were out here were going to go in hell because of your double predestination mentality of, uh, of, of God's election. Um, I don't have that view. I believe that God made it possible for all men to come to Jesus Christ. And those people who would choose to come to Christ, they would be elected um, to become his children. Okay. The Bible says that, that 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 God's will is that all men might be saved. If that's the case, and he is saying that that's his will, and he's choosing three people to be saved, and then inadvertently say, ah, oh, who cares about those three? They're going to get thrown in the lake of fire. Um, how does that coincide with that passage where it says that God wills all people to be saved? Obviously, that's not the case. He wills that some would be saved and some would not be saved. But I'll take it a step further. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, uh, and I'm going to read to you what the Bible predicts the church will look like before the man of sin revealed. It's been revealed. It talks about perilous times. Um, it says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, a haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Okay? So the Bible is predicting, and as a matter of fact, if you actually read on to the next chapter, it talks about how people would not uh, listen to sound doctrine anymore, but rather they will listen to teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. Okay? So... This idea that Christians won't do anything that is so terrible that it will knock them out of fellowship with God is utterly ridiculous. And there's other passages in scripture to suggest this as well. Furthermore, the evidence that we have that we are in fellowship with God, it doesn't result in condemnation. It doesn't result in guilt. When we have fellowship with God and right fellowship as that. Um, typically we're filled with joy and all of the fruits of the spirit. But what happens when you go to a passage like Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, and it says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come quickly, or I will come unto thee quickly, and, re and, and will remove thy candlesticks out of thy place, except, except thou repent. Okay? Revelation chapter 22, 19. And if any man shall take, uh, shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away... His part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from all the things which are written in this book. Again, this idea that a Christian can, can't um, do anything that would take them out of fellowship with God is ridiculous. Um, I don't know how long you've been a believer one way, but are you telling me that there's never been a sin to take you out of Bible study temporarily? Or there's been a sin that's kept you away from prayer because you've enjoyed doing something that was wrong for a period of time? I don't know if there's been a a time where where you couldn't worship God the way you wanted to 
because of a lingering uh, because of lingering sin or because of something that you were dealing with in your life personally. If that has ever happened at least one time, then you know full well what I'm talking about, that one could be taken out of fellowship with God. Um, and I'm referring to a believer at this point. I have a different understanding of this passage of scripture now, but when I was in the one safe, always safe camp, the passage of scripture I always ran to was Romans chapter 8, where it says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But that's the key point. A lot of people are just reading that so fast. They're not paying attention to what they're reading. It says that those who are in Christ Jesus and are called according to his purpose. So you have to be in Christ Jesus in order to not be in a state of condemnation. If you are living in sin or practicing sin on a regular basis and you are not repenting about it, if you don't feel some type of godly sorrow about it, if you haven't turned from it and you continually practice it over and over and over again, you are not in fellowship with God. You are lying to yourself if you say you are, and you need to repent. It's just that simple. And this is where it gets very passionate for me because you have some Christians on YouTube that do things that they know is simple, they know is wrong, they know is evil, and they're not repenting about it. They do this over and over and over again, and they don't feel the need to repent because they don't got nothing to worry about. Because once you say those magic words and you become a believer and you show some fruit and you're saved, you can never, ever, 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 ever fall away from the faith. And that, my friend, is unbiblical and it is undoctrinal and it is utter nonsense. But let's get to your third uh, answer to my question, because I'm sure this is going to be interesting. The third and final question is just as good, brother. If, as a non-believer, sin separates you from God, if, as a Christian, you sin and that takes you out of fellowship with God, does that mean you have fallen from grace, brother? And before you answer that question, please keep in mind Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, brother, where these Christians was getting back entangled with the Mosaic Law. They were seeking to get their justification, brother, from the Mosaic Law. See, that's where, you're, that's where you're wrong. Galatians chapter 5 is not isolated from Galatians 1, 2, 3, or 4. You have to read these things in context. And so I will take this opportunity um, to give you Norman Geisler's answer to this question, because it's it's just such a uh, canard that's thrown out. I, I'm actually going to use an, uh, a non-reformed person's response to rebut your to rebut what you're what you're saying here, man. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm keeping in mind the question, okay? The question that you're asking. Look, I have this all neatly prepared. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Uh, prepare yourself to give answers like this, right? So you asked, if the previous things are true, does that mean you would have fallen from grace? I would say yes, if the same definition of grace applies to the previous two questions. But no, it doesn't. If we come to Galatians 5.4, and I'm just going to read this, and this comes directly from a book entitled Four Views of Eternal Security, where there's a Wesleyan, a Reformed Arminian, a hard-line Calvinist, and a moderate Calvinist exchanging dialogues, rebutting each other, and having a grand old time in publication. And during this course, uh, Norman Geisler, who considers himself a moderate. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there one way. And the reason why I'm going to do that, because this video is kind of, kind of long. It, it has been pretty long as it is. Um, so I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And I'm going to go to verse 4. And I may read a couple of verses after that, if necessary, uh, to, to give people the context of what they're reading here. Okay, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the, with, with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. 
For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor do, to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And all this is a saying is, is that these believers who started off believing by faith alone, okay, started, uh, was, was, was being tempted or got entangled with some false teachings where they were, where they were seeking to be justified by the law. They wanted to get physically circumcised. We had the Judaizers coming in in those days saying, listen, uh, it's great that Jesus died for our sins, but you know what? He wasn't enough. Now you got to obey the Mosaic law. It's the start of being circumcised. And if you get circumcised and Christ has no effect for you because now you're seeking to be justified by the law rather than that by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Okay? So, again, I have to stop you there because you don't know, well, I ain't going to say that you don't know what you're talking about. I think you're, you're, you're turning something that is very simple and making it complicated to fit your needs. So, let me give all of you a verse uh, that's not even in the book of Galatians to show you that if you try to justify yourself by the law, that you are not of Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, it, it says, uh, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, again, the Judaizers were trying to get these early Christians to go back to the law. And we know from reading in Romans, which comes before the book of Galatians, that, um, that, that if you try to do that, then you're not in right standings with God. Which again brings up a very interesting question. And that question is, is can a believer get entangled with this kind of thing? I would say yes. And I'll give you a practical example, since one way went to a book outside of scripture. Okay? Um, in this example that I want to give you, take a brand new believer. First, person just got saved yesterday. They haven't gotten a real Bible study time in. They don't really know the scripture that well. They're, 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 they're not like uh, mature. They're on milk. And someone comes along to them and says, listen, it's great that you know Christ. You know what I mean? But you still got to observe the Sabbath. You can't eat these meats. You can't do this. You can't do that. And then this disciple listens to this. And then they start to do those things. They are no longer justified by Christ and Christ only. Now they're trying to be justified by the law. And then a correction comes and they don't accept this correction, you can't say that they were never part of Christ to begin with. They were deceived and they were fooled. It would be by the grace of God that that individual would repent and be in right standings with God altogether. So again, uh, one way, um, I think you're wrong. I don't think you understand Galatians chapter four and what it's actually saying or what Paul rather was saying to the Galatians during that particular time. The reason why I ask these three questions, guys, is because I want to know where the Calvinists is coming from with their understanding. Not the Calvinists, I'm sorry. The people who believe in this once save, always save uh, uh, mentality. Uh, what they understand about salvation and how a person is saved and how God maintains that individual to be saved. Um, I, 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 that was the whole point of asking these questions. These wasn't difficult questions I was asking. It was set up questions to get you to express what you know about salvation. Now, for those of you who are interested in watching all of these videos in their entirety, if you look in the description of this video, you will see the links to One Way Apologetics uh, channel and the video that he made in response to my three questions. And you'll also Christ see Christian Anarchist, um, uh, 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 the full video, uninterrupted, on his channel. I'm also going to provide a link for Veckel's eight-hour Google Hangout that he did on this topic in the description. There is no way in the world I was going to be able to produce a video that you guys are actually going to watch from beginning to end. I highly doubt you even going to watch that with this one. But just watch the original videos in the description and then you'll understand why I chose to do it this way. Uh, I'm going to try to find a way to answer Veckel's question. Maybe I'll have Veckel do a one-on-one -on -one with me or maybe I'll do a G-Man versus the world and I'll screen share what he had to say. But because Veckel is so thorough, and couldn't condense everything to like a 15 or 20 minute video. Um, it's going to be really difficult to do that. So um, I got some other stuff I'm going to be uploading uh, regarding this topic. As well as obviously the atheist issues and other stuff that I'm looking to do. And until next time guys, it's been another edition of uh, Preaching to the Choir Ministries. Telling you guys to study, think for yourself, and don't be so committed to a man that you forget about the person of Jesus Christ. Read your Bible and do what it says. God bless.